Hey there, this is a berserk video. So it's probably going to end up talking about some dark topics. This means I probably won't be able to monetize this bad boy, so consider giving it a like, a subscribe, and even hitting the bell. With that out of the way, let's get into it. The mind is a very complicated thing. The brain by itself is an incredibly complex thinking biological machine, but the mind that emerges from that machine is far more difficult to understand. Think of it as hardware versus software, both complicated things, but in very different ways. Have you ever had a computer with a broken OS, or had a glitch in a game that defies all physical logic? It's infuriating, right? It can be frightening even. There's a ton of gaming media from horror titles to creepypastas that utilize this very well. Now imagine that happening to your mind. Something appears in your vision that shouldn't be there, some fact appears in your mind that you don't remember learning. Some belief that you've never held before becomes truer to you than a message from God herself. When these things happen, especially if they happen often or all at once, it can become very difficult to tell not just if these things are real, but what reality itself even is. You enter a state which is known as psychosis. It's one of those things that movies and media often do a poor job of portraying. I watched Psycho as a kid, I watched Fight Club as a teenager, great movies. Some of the best movies of all time, in fact. We should do this again, we should do this again sometime. The problem with a lot of media that covers mental health is that writers love giving you all the supporting information they wrote about that character and all the details of what's wrong with them. Encountering psychosis in real life, however, is very different. You never have a writer's knowledge of a real person. You'll never know every event in someone's life and most importantly, you will never be able to know how they perceived it when it happened. And that's with people who aren't suffering from psychosis. When someone's been in and out of psychosis throughout their life, these things become impossible for them to remember or understand. Information from the outside world becomes unreliable. Your perception of that information breaks down, and if it goes far enough, your entire concept of reality as a stable, predictable environment is lost. Now, I just ragged on a lot of great movies that deal with mental health, yes. Not because they do a poor job of representing it exactly, at least sometimes they get some stuff right. But when it comes to psychosis in particular, sometimes the story that isn't told gives you more insight than the story that is. That's where Berserk comes in. At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. Berserk, for those who don't know, is the immortal titan of manga created by Kentaro Miura, which became so influential in creative media that shades of it can be seen in almost everything that involves swords, fighting, or fighting with swords. It's adored by fans of ultraviolence, grimdark, high fantasy, and even romance. But personally, the thing I love most about it is its willingness to brave dark, treacherous waters in order to discuss mental health, and it doing so with such profound honesty especially when it comes to the main character, Guts. I've talked before about how he is a shining portrayal of not only the effect that sexual abuse can have on your life, but what can be done to combat it and keep moving forward. I've talked about how his role within the story as the ultimate survivor sends a message to those struggling through the after effects of trauma, that even if you mess up and go back to square one, you can still keep going. But that's not the complete picture of Guts' psychology, not even close. Berserk's characterization is head-crushingly deep, always has been, and just as with people in real life, sexual abuse is not the entirety of his trauma, just as roots are not the entirety of the tree. Above ground, higher up the tree, there are branches, and there is one particular branch that often gets ignored or overlooked during discussions of guts, one that can teach us just a little bit about a very complicated thing. Guts suffers from psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> we are always watching you. Psychosis, the noun, and psychotic, the adjective, are mental health terms that, like all medical language, get abused, taken out of context, and twisted by uninformed people online all the time. 
He's not psychotic. He's autistic. So before I can get into what it actually means, let's talk about what it isn't. Firstly, being psychotic is not being a psychopath. Psychopathy refers to having a lack of care for the emotions or lives of people who are not you. Think of it as the opposite of empathy and you're most of the way there. People in psychosis can and often do feel empathetic for the people around them, even if they may act on it in ways that don't make sense to you. Secondly, being psychotic is not being schizophrenic. Schizophrenia can cause psychosis, but it's not the only thing that can. Bipolar disorder can do it, schizoaffective disorder can do it, PTSD can do it. Yeah, severe trauma is that powerful. Bear that in mind for later. Thirdly, being psychotic is not dissociation. This is a bit more tricky to draw the line through, but to massively oversimplify, a person who is dissociating, willingly or unwillingly, is disconnected from reality. Psychotic people can, and often are, trying very hard to connect with reality. It's just the medium they use to do that, their mind and their perceptions, are not working right at the moment. Fourthly, being psychotic is not having a split personality. There's a reason that it's called dissociative identity disorder, people. DID, or having a plural of identities, is not a psychotic disorder. We know that because people with DID are perfectly capable of making the sense a world around them and processing it rationally. Identity is not a part of your external world, it's a very internal process. So understanding that requires a different rule set to be applied. And lastly, being psychotic is not just being really angry about something and not making much sense. The big thing about psychosis is that it has to be internally incoherent. A homeless man ranting loudly about how he's broke, tired and has no food, even if he scares you, is not necessarily psychotic. If he starts blaming this on the Jews because they caused 9-11 and faked the moon landing in order to hijack NASA to poison your thoughts with the orbital satellite they bought from the Chinese who hate the Jews because the Jews committed software violations during the Cold War, and we are developing ethnic bioweapons. That's where all those labs in the Ukraine are about. They're collecting Russian DNA. They're collecting China. Who's been stealing your thoughts? And they put everything to do He might be. Okay, sure. So that's what psychosis isn't. Let's look at what it is. The Google definition describes it as follows. A severe mental condition in which thoughts and emotions are so affected that contact is lost with external reality. Now I know what you're thinking, Berserk fans. Wait, but Guts isn't disconnected from reality. He's the guy who's always living in the moment and fighting through situations that endanger not just him but other people too. Very well observed, Berserk fans. The Google definition is way too basic bit of description for me, because it does the thing I mentioned earlier and conflates it with dissociation in some way. A better description to me would be something like this. Psychosis is a mental state where thoughts or emotions are so effective that you perceive and interpret reality in a limited or distorted way compared to others around you. A little more clunky and technical perhaps, but I think more accurate. Not all people with psychosis detach from reality completely, but all of them perceive reality very differently to everyone else. And that's something that Guts certainly does. Some of which is explained by the law of the berserk world, some of it is not. But let's ignore the law for a moment and get diagnostic. Psychosis is built around three core clusters of symptoms that affect both your thoughts and your emotions. The first is hallucinations. This is the most famous one. Seeing things that aren't there, hearing voices that aren't there. Classic movie mental health stuff, right? Well, it's a bit more complex than that. Firstly, it can affect all five senses. Let me tell you, the first time I heard about touch hallucinations, God damn, those sound terrifying. Secondly, hallucinations are not as simple as, oh, I see a bear in my room now, I'm getting my bear mace. You like bear mace, eyes head? Bear mace? You're going with Christ! <laughs> Ow! The hallucinations often occur first in the corners of your eyes, outside your direct focus, a place where your eye can't actually see much and your brain has to sort of fill in the gaps in your memory. It can, of course, make you think that you're seeing a bear, but the bear doesn't always pop out right in front of your face so you can get a good look at it. It's also worth noting here that just because you see or hear something that isn't real doesn't mean you automatically believe it. 
If I take a huge dose of magic mushrooms in Elden Ring, I will see the walls move and the colours change, but I won't suddenly start to plan to get my room repainted because I know it isn't real. Same thing with video games. Unironically this time. I won't hesitate to blast a mofo with a shotgun in GTA because they aren't real people and I know that. In real life, I'm going to be more aware of the consequences of shooting someone in the face, and I'm not going to do it. Sorry, President Macron. Perhaps those riots were caused by something else. The second type of psychosis, and another word that gets abused constantly, is delusions. Contrary to popular belief, there is a difference between being delusional and being wrong or misled. Children believe in Santa Claus all the time, not because they're delusional, but because their parents told them that he brings them presents, and they haven't seen their parents sneaking presents around under the tree when they go to bed on Christmas Eve yet. Delusions come in a variety of flavours, but they all share the same basic core. They are beliefs that are not only wrong, but that no other person believes, and this is the crucial thing, cannot be shaken by directly contradictory experiences or evidence. This word gets abused by being thrown at trans people a lot for this reason, but it's worth remembering that gender identity is just an expression of an internal feeling about yourself. It has no objective basis, so we can't prove if it's real or not. A true delusion is not saying that you're a woman, something with no measurable or objective character, but saying something like, I'm a rich successful businessman who owns 14 cars. That man could be part of this world's true privileged class. That man could have the absolute power of a god. When in reality you ran an ice cream shop that failed in its first three months because you started it in winter and you drive a Fiat Punto. Objective, measurable things. If the facts can't and don't shake your faith, then that faith is delusional. For most people in psychosis, delusional beliefs seem as real as 2.2 equaling 4, and they often arrive without any new information or experience being had. They just show up one day, fully formed, rather than being put together from information and perceptive experience over time. Fun fact, if you want to know whether your knowledge is delusional or not, ask yourself this. Do you remember how and when you learned the information? If you don't, maybe go check on it. Disorganised thinking is a much less well-known but still very important part of the psychotic experience. The inability to control the speed and direction of your thoughts and or speech. You may have seen the stereotype of the person who is mentally unwell, pacing and muttering very fast to themselves under their breath. This is where that comes from. The mumbling, ranting, or what we in the biz call pressured speech is just a symptom of the rapid thinking underneath. Their thoughts go so fast that they become difficult to even register before the next one pushes it out of the way, and ideas pop up and disappear so rapidly that when they try and communicate their thoughts, it comes out as word salad. Another famous term from the inside of the biz there. Uh, you know, um... I'm sorry, just sometimes I think about seven thoughts at one time because anything I see, I come up with like seven answers to it and then just choose what it is. But when you're thinking that fast all the time without any way of stopping it, your mind tries to make sense of things by linking ideas and words by how they sound or some arbitrary criteria like that. I've got to think like Trump. So first, I'm not going to take my meds. <laughs> I see patterns where none exist. This is why people who struggle with psychosis connect things that don't have anything to do with each other. But I, what, the thing is, when I said my children, the reason why my my brain kind of blocked because it's like God is saying, you know, your your children are going to be okay. The you know, baby mama's got money, right? God is using me. He's breaking me down. It's like trying to make a poem by picking random rhyming words to form your stanzas. You might get a sentence out, but it won't have any meaning that can be understood by other people. Now, these three psychological phenomena are not mutually exclusive, of course, but it's possible to be in psychosis with only one of these symptoms if they are severe enough. Okay, now, it's one thing to tell you what psychosis can feel like, and everyone's experience is different, but what I'm going to do now is simulate a training exercise I had once to give you just a little bit of insight into how difficult simple interactions can be while struggling with psychotic symptoms. A show rather than tell, if you will. Oh, by the way, if you suffer from psychosis or have in the past, this is a trigger warning. This experience is going to be unpleasant even if you don't suffer with them. So if you have, skip ahead to this time code. If you're sure you want to go ahead, 
This experience will be much more realistic with headphones, so go grab those now. Hello, sir. Can I help you? You know that the Russians you. killed robots. Are you what you okay? okay? He's going to call the police. What the government? What? Sir, your way. don't cut you off. What you say? Can you, you to call someone? Yeah. There's You're no the escape. The the Jesus. Jesus. Don't you don't seem to be okay. Can I help? Just imagine that, but worse and all the time. Do you see how experiencing that could make things a little bit difficult in your day to day? Oh, with that kind of stuff going on, I'd find it difficult to tie my shoes in the morning. That's the power that these three symptoms have on you. It's also worth pointing out that the emergence of these symptoms is not intrinsically linked to what you might call the classic psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. OCD and eating disorders, for example, can lead people to have some pretty delusional beliefs about how much you should weigh or how clean your hands need to be. For Guts, it's worth noting that a lot of these symptoms are not present from the beginning of his story. For the entirety of the Golden Age arc, while he struggles with the aftermath of his abusive childhood, the story and his perception of events remain pretty grounded and straightforward. Guts does not exhibit most of the signs that will be commonly associated with a naturally occurring psychotic disorder. He isn't paranoid and conspiratorial in his thinking. He doesn't have flights of ideas or even have any delusions of grandeur like Griffith does, at least during the Golden Age arc. So what changes between then and the rest of- oh, yeah. Love, hate, ultimate pleasure, ultimate pain, life and death, all here to enjoy before our very eyes. If there was ever an event in the history of fiction that could drive a character to madness, it would be the Eclipse. The Eclipse takes damn near everything from Guts. His friends are killed, all of them in horrifying and excruciating ways. His best friend betrays them turning into something akin to a god by sacrificing all their lives to achieve his ambition of absolute power. His lover, Casca, the person who helped him heal his wounds and be free of his trauma for the first time in his entire life, is brutally raped and traumatized by a man she once loved and idolized, and Guts is forced to watch, helplessly. Ah! Is anyone still alive? Judo! Pippin! Carcass! After the Eclipse, Guts is a changed man. Not just because of his eye on his arm, not just because he is now branded and permanently trapped in the cosmic space between life and death, but because his outlook on life is permanently altered too. He is not searching for a purpose anymore. He is not a lone swordsman fighting to improve and test his skills. He is at war. A war that, with Casca unable to fight or even speak, he decides to fight alone. It's at this moment, during the declaration of the war, that we see a new type of Guts emerge from the bloody mess that was the Eclipse. This is Guts with acute PTSD. Just like any soldier whose entire unit was wiped out but who somehow survived, a PTSD so severe that the walls of reality start breaking down for him. The sprint started it, but the declaration set it in motion. This is war. It ain't any different from any other war. Last one standing wins. Like many soldiers whose PTSD and guilt drives them into psychosis, Guts came back from the war and yet cannot leave it. His mind refuses to believe that the war is over and declares that he will hunt down the monsters to the last one and fight destiny until they finish him or he finishes them. The delusional belief that not only is he still a hawk, still at war, and still able to win that war, is the start of his long journey into psychosis. It starts with the declaration and his single-minded desire to kill every apostle he can find, but it carries on well after his recovery. When the sniffer apostle attacks Godo's shop, he calls it the first in his hunt. When Rickert kindly suggests that Guts stay with them and keep Casca close to him, he tries to point out the Hawks are well... gone. Guts doesn't even entertain the point because the three of them are still standing. He simply tells him to defend the leader of the Hawks while he raids the enemy camp. 
Guts's internal monologue is confused as he leaves. He isn't really sure what he said, or if he means what he said. All he knows is he is compelled forward. The thoughts rushing through his head don't matter. Just put one foot in front of the other. That's good enough for him. This is the starting point of Guts's psychosis. Post the eclipse, he manages to convince himself he is still a soldier, still a hawk fighting the war alone. Of course, what happens over the next two years will make it much, much worse. As we see in the Black Swordsman arc, Guts's life has now become a constant bloody struggle. He shows up looking for an apostle, baits them out or corners them. I'll let you live so you can take a message to your master for me. Tell him the Black Swordsman has come. And hacks him to pieces over an epic series of action sequences that leave the monster dead and him barely alive, losing blood and scarred mentally forever. While we only get to see a few instances of this happening, and we get very little insight into Guts' internal self during this arc, being mostly told from the perspective of Puck, we do get glimpses of the turmoil going on inside him. Puck sensing his rage through the facade, his haughty dismissal of death to the old man in the wagon, his pure fury at Griffith when they finally see each other again. Griffith! The most important fact we learn about this two-year period of his life is that he's alone. He refuses to talk to Puck. If he talks to any of the other characters, they are immediately either killed or he abandons them. We also learn that he's being haunted every moment he isn't in the safe light of the sun. The effect this has on him is hammered home by the next arc in the timeline and one of my personal favourites, the Lost Children arc. What might be considered the peak of Guts losing his grip on reality. After two years, we find Guts under a haunted tree. The changes he's been through in the last two years are becoming quite obvious. He looks dead inside. He's struggling to communicate normally, even when he doesn't want it to sound like a threat. Killing people matters even less now than it did before, and he has no problem using a small child as bait for a horde of child-stealing hornet fairies. The most important thing to his mental state, however, is this. The sheer lack of sleep he's been getting for two years. As frequent watchers of my videos who always like, comment, subscribe and hit the bell will know, I used to work in psychiatric intensive care, and one of the roles that ward played was as an assessment unit for people who have psychotic episodes out of nowhere. This is kind of anecdotal, but by far the most common drug that sent people our way was speed, methamphetamines. Why? Because if you overdo a night on the booze, you pass out. If you overdo weed, you pass out. If you overdo speed, you can be up for a week without sleep, and that messes you up. Those of us with regular sleep patterns take it for granted how much sleep does for keeping our perceptions of reality stuck together. I once stayed up for about 48 hours on an energy drink IV, trying to get my dissertation done in time because I misheard when the deadline was. By the end of that process, I was not the same person anymore. I was a goddamn liability. There always seemed to be something in the corner of my eye and I kept jumping at noises that were far away but sounded really close. Having to cross the road on the way home was a harrowing test of will. That was two days of no sleep. At the beginning of Lost Children, Guts says he hasn't seen the sun in three days, which means he hasn't been able to catch sleep in three days, which seems to be a pretty common occurrence for him. His connection to reality is hanging on by a thread here, and the fact that he's constantly haunted by spirits, evil trees, and flaming child guilt ghosts cannot be helping. The night before his fight with Razim, we see Guts resorted to chewing some kind of coca leaves to stay awake, here acting as a stand-in for amphetamines. It's the only time we ever see him do this, but if he has made a habit of using like this, there's only one way that can go. This disconnection from humanity, delusion about his purpose and lack of regular sleep have created a new Guts. The black swordsman who doesn't like to think too much or plan things out in advance, he just acts, like a beast of war that travels the land hunting on instinct. Mira very effectively communicates this new persona from right at the beginning with a single, simple gesture. One artistic decision that shows just how different this version of Guts is and how close to losing his mind he's becoming. That fucking smile. From its first appearance during the declaration of war, that smile is never far from Guts' face. Whenever the chance of killing an apostle presents itself, 
whenever the spirits that haunt him get a little too much, there it is, in all its disturbing, sadistic glory. Guts gets accused by people who write pages for TV tropes of never smiling any other way. But this one, this particular smile, starts here, as a signal that Guts' connection to reality is getting closer and closer to snapping for good. Now, does Guts ever really lose his grip on reality entirely? Not really, but he gets pretty damn close in the Lost Children arc, and his actions, especially towards other people around him, demonstrate that. He doesn't just come off as cold and unfeeling, he comes off as dangerous and unpredictable. His ability to connect cause and effect is shaky at best, and it leads him to make some pretty serious errors in PR. Rather than say, there were no cattle in that barn, or sorry about using him as bait, I had to get them away from the village, he instead laughs at an angry mob and calls them all spineless cowards and then takes Jill as a human shield. His actions just don't seem to be grounded by rational decision making anymore. But this is all just lead up to the main event. One of the most vicious and violent fights in the entire series, his fight with the apostle Rosine. Rosine is one of the more interesting apostles in Berserk. She's not a blood knight seeking a challenge like Nosferatu Zod. She's not a hyper-ambitious false god like Ganishka. She's not even a petty, flesh-eating tyrant like the Snake Baron. Humans are mere food for us. <laughs> She's a teenage girl who ran away from home. The tragedy of Razine's story, that she was always more kind of a victim than a villain, has been discussed in many video essays at some length, including the fact that she mirrors guts in many ways. Both of them suffer childhood trauma. Both of them were raised by men who hated their existence. Both of them swore revenge against the group who wronged them. And, most critically, Razine is also suffering from psychosis. Do me a favor and look yourself in the mirror. Ask yourself, am I perfect yet? I've said before that when Guts first fought against Nosferatu Zod, he was looking into a mirror. A mirror that showed him where his rage and use of combat to escape trauma was taking him. When Guts finally faces Rosine after the long, slow, trudging hunt through the mountains, it happens again. Exhausted from fighting his way through her minions and not sleeping for close on five days, he's barely a man anymore. Everyone remembers this fight for a specific theme, one that's present throughout, in not just the chapter titles, but in the dialogue and the artwork itself. The theme of Guts becoming more monster than the apostle he's fighting. When Jill sees him behind the flames, she sees him as more terrifying than Rosine. Even Rosine herself asks, what the hell are you? Several of Mira's most iconic panels are found in this fight. The slasher smile returns, of course, but there are many others that make you feel like he's trying to one-up himself with every chapter, testing his ability to make Guts look completely evil without giving him haunt. Several of the panels don't even give him a face, just a single glowing eye or a glimpse of a smile. This is all on purpose, of course. In fact, it deliberately contrasts Rosine, the most human of the apostles, with Guts, the most monstrous of men. Guts is pushed to his limits several times in this fight, both physically and tactically. Guts lets his own arm get punctured just to get a shot in with the cannon, uses her human attachment to Jill to bait her down to the ground and, lest we forget, takes a stinger through his face, bites down on it, and uses that as leverage to land the killing blow. It's one of Berserk's most brutal fights, and it brings out everything that is monstrous about Guts by acting as a perfect reflection of his slackening grip on reality. Rosine was a child of abusive parents who ran away to find the sacred land of the elves that she always dreamed of. Her life was miserable and full of beatings from a father who considered her a child born of rape, who thought of her as a source of shame. So she ran. She ran so far away from that to find a place where she could be what she wanted, an elf, and through the power of the bailet, this childish fantasy of being free from her family and queen of the elves finally came true, at least to her. Rosine sacrificed her parents to achieve her fantasy and force it into reality. To her, she was never a monster. She was just the queen of the elves, as she was always meant to be. While the other apostles in this story have no illusions about their place in the world as monsters, Rosine perceives herself as the elf queen, and human grown-ups as the monsters, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Like her own insectoid form and the true faces of her minions being wasp-like and twisted. 
she deludes herself and them into thinking all kinds of horrors from eating flesh to adult attack are not only normal but moral things to do her delusion only begins to break down right after guts lands the killing blow after so long rosine seems to remember what happened when she became a monster she remembers that the elves were never here not until she made them feeling death creeping up on her rosine manages to dispel her delusions if only for a moment and beg forgiveness for her actions guts steps in to finish the job covered with blood and mud and full of the desire to kill her jill jumps in front and begs him to let her die peacefully that stops him for a moment she even dares to question why he hates apostles so much bless jill she doesn't know. Guts shoves her away without answering. When she jumps in front of his sword again, he hesitates for a moment. Is it really worth killing this girl just to kill the monster bleeding out underneath her? It's hard to know exactly what his thought process was here, but this is the moment that Guts is once again looking into the mirror and seeing his own reflection. Rosine is a broken, morally bankrupt, sadistic, cruel and deluded monster, convinced of her own righteousness even as she kills and abuses children. Guts, standing there with his sword rays, is a broken, morally bankrupt, sadistic, cruel, and delusional man, convinced of his own righteousness even as he's preparing to kill this abused child, Jill. If he cuts her down, he would kill Rosine, but he would also never come back from his delusional world, where he is the one avenging the Hawks and will eventually get close enough to Griffith to destroy him. One swing, one swing, and he abandons his morality, confirms his status as a monster, and he loses grip on reality completely just to chase his comforting delusion. It's interesting that he decides to swing. He never completes the swing, of course, the intervention of Jill's father and the Holy Iron Chain Knights make sure of that, but he does decide to swing. Despite it all, Jill tracks him down in the darkness. Jill, despite nearly dying several times and nearly going mad herself, trapped in the woods, surrounded by flames and covered with the decomposing organs of children, still wants him to take her away. Seeking a comforting delusion of her own, Jill is trying to do the same thing Rosine did and Guts has been on the edge of doing for some time, escaping reality. While Rosine found her delusion through a bailet and Guts was driven to it by the eclipse against his will, Jill is openly wanting to escape into a fairy tale like them because her reality is just too much to bear. Guts of course reminds her, there is no paradise for you to escape to. His battlefield is not hers, and even if it was, she wouldn't want it. Guts, as mentally broken and wild-eyed with deluded madness as he is, manages to ground himself through the perspective of Jill, even though a minute ago he was poised to kill her. He's still calling his life a battlefield, but at least he's not claiming that's a good thing anymore. He's beginning to reject the comforting delusion that has been keeping him on this journey for so long. While he won the battle with Rosine, and was face to face with the very thing he is becoming in his quest for revenge, afterwards a new battle begins inside Guts. A new part of his psychosis has begun to awaken. It's impossible. There's no way that a monster like this can exist. Not in the real world. The Beast of Darkness is an iconic image in Berserk, which is interesting because when it first appears, it's almost formless and shifts constantly from panel to panel, but when it does form, it's interesting that it takes the shape of something said by Casca. All you care about is swinging your sword against others. You don't care at all about the lives of the men you lead. You're just a mad dog! Being called a mad dog by Casca clearly touched a nerve in Guts all those years ago, even though he hadn't realised his feelings for her yet. After the fight with Rosine, Guts, terrified by what he saw in Rosine and now sees inside himself, has his first head-to-head -head encounter with the mad dog. At first it taunts him. Reminds him that Rosine and all her minions were just victimised children, toys with his guilt pressing salt into his wounds. Then it stops taunting and starts making suggestions. 
to kill, to keep killing, to remain alone forever, to become a monster, to become like Griffith. <laughs> Pushing that particular button is what finally draws a reaction from Guts, and he begins to slip into despair. He finally faces his delusional outlook head on. He's been chasing down the apostles for years, he's cut down so many and caused so much destruction that he's being hunted by the church and apostles literally know him by reputation alone. I've heard rumours about you. You're the one who's been making trouble for all of us servants. You. He even managed to infiltrate the deepest layers of the astral world and take a shot at Griffith himself. Yeah, people forget about that sometimes because it was in the Black Swordsman arc. But he actually did get what he was looking for a year before this. And what could he do when he got shot at his target? He couldn't even touch it. He's right to despair. He's been chasing something which is not only out of reach, but the chase is evidently killing him, not just physically, but mentally. As displayed by the fact that the mad dog, everything he claimed he wasn't, and the thing that he always hated most about himself, is now whispering in his ear, telling him to kill. Guts doesn't let the delusion of revenge go immediately, of course. That wouldn't happen until cracks in the blade, where he finally gets to process his feelings just a little bit. But, just as in real life, you can't really talk your way out of hallucinations that easily. The world of Berserk is a strange place. It has a lot of elements of both dark fantasy and high fantasy that get explained piecemeal throughout the story. To try and explain it as simply as possible though, it revolves around the power of will. No one is made into an apostle. They have to will it, and their desires dictate the form they assume afterwards. All the magical beasts and monsters that exist in the astral world are created in some way by human legend and stories, by human belief. Falconia, the entire city, was created by the force of Griffith's will alone. The spirits that harass Guts every night are motivated by their restless will to try and recapture their lives. For those who have read the semi-canonical chapter 83, this is spelled out in plain language by God itself. The most powerful thinking entity in existence, God, says that it was born of humanity's collective desire to explain and rationalise the cruelty and chaos of existence. People in this universe, even normal, non-guts level people, have the desire to manifest anything if they have enough will. For that reason, it's difficult to know exactly what the Beast of Darkness even is. Is it a real monster that is manifested by Guts' desire to kill? Or is it a hallucination, a symptom of his psychosis arriving in response to stress? It's hard to say for sure, but let's look at the way it acts, shall we? Firstly, only Guts can see it. The beast interacts with him and him alone. The only other person to even come close is Shirke when she uses magic to enter his mind. Secondly, much like a hallucination, it exists only to compel Guts to do something. Hallucinations in the real world are not always telling people to kill, mind you. Sometimes they even say nice things or just appear to scare the shit out of you. But for Guts, the Beats of Darkness has only one command. Kill. Destroy. Hunt. Lastly, and most importantly, it only appears when Guts is at his most stressed. Not just his lowest emotional point, but his most stressed moments. After the fight with Rosine. After realising he abandoned Casca. While he's trying to keep Casca safe by himself and struggling to do so. Whenever he's at his most alone, most stressed and most sleep deprived, the beast shows up, taunting, mocking, instructing him to abandon everything and drown himself in his bloodlust. In almost every sense, it acts like a hallucination. In real life, stress and lack of sleep, as I've already mentioned, can trigger psychotic episodes and of course the hallucinations that come with them, especially when the psychotic disorder itself was formed of stress from something like PTSD. The Beast is a perfect representation of how hallucinations work, for one more important reason though. You never know when it'll come back, but it always does. Treating psychosis is one of the great medical challenges of the modern era. In the old days, we had no way of treating it, so governments at the time simply locked them up in asylums until they died. With the discovery of antipsychotics, 
We gained a valuable weapon in the fight, but I'd be lying if I said they were perfect. Haldol, or to give its full name Haloperidol, was discovered in the 50s, and while it can lessen the symptoms a lot, it has nasty side effects that require stimulants to counteract. The stereotype of the mental patient shuffling around, not able to raise their feet too high? That's a side effect of too much haloperidol. Olanzapine can be effective, but it often leads to weight gain by making it impossible to feel full. This leads to a lot of people stopping taking it and becoming unwell again. Clozapine, when it was discovered in the 80s, was heralded as a wonder drug that might be able to cure even the most severe schizophrenia, and while it's effective as hell at that, it does take a huge toll on the body and requires regular heart checkups, along with slow titration of the dosage, at least in the NHS. This leads to a lot of hesitancy about taking it, and hesitancy amongst doctors for giving it. Now, all these drugs, and the others I didn't mention, are important parts of people's lives. They do help a lot of people lead as normal and fulfilling a life as possible. So if you are taking these medications, don't let anything, especially some dumbass online like me, convince you that it's a bad thing, or that you should stop taking them. You don't want to become yay after all. The point I was making is that our treatments for psychosis are not perfect, and because of their imperfections, the harmful symptoms of psychosis can and often do come back, especially if you've been having a really bad time lately. Like Guts does. A lot. The Beast of Darkness is a perfect representation of that. Even when it's repressed for a period of time, it never dies. It merely sleeps, waiting for the time to strike. The Beast, and the fear of it taking control of him, of that monster driving his actions, is best demonstrated by one of the most painful and hard to justify moments of Berserk. The time that it did drive his actions. Chapter 190, The Fangs of Ego, is a really horrible chapter to read ones that fans still debate to this day because it reflects very poorly on Guts himself as a character. At this point in the story, Guts is travelling with Casca alone, trying to take her back to Puck's home island. Due to some regrettable actions brought upon by demonic possession, she has become very wary of him and escapes while Guts is asleep. In a childlike state, Casca wanders into a group of thieves who try to rape her. Casca, sensing what is about to happen, flashes back to the Eclipse, and by the time Guts gets to her, the thieves are dead and a bloody Casca stands there rattled, but unharmed. Armed now, she takes the opportunity to attack Guts. He disarms and overpowers her fairly easily, but the sight of her naked body seems to trigger something dark. Guts, if even for a moment, attempts to force himself on her, in a move with chilling similarity to the Eclipse, the Beast of Darkness lurking behind his eyes, egging him on, commanding him to Rip her to shreds, the way Griffith did. Make everything food for your malice. Guts manages to snap out of it, shocked and with no memory of what happened. He can only believe it when he sees the proof right in front of him. He, Casca's so-called protector, just assaulted her. This is a big debate amongst fans. Did Guts himself do this? Or was he possessed by the beast? Was this a moment of weakness? Or a moment of possession? The thing about the Beast of Darkness is that it never really possesses him directly at any other point of the story. It talks to him and whispers evil stuff, sure, but possession is something that external things do, that hallucinations cannot. So is Guts deciding to do this then? No. This is a psychotic episode, not just in metaphor, but a straight-up depiction of a psychotic episode. At some point during the struggle with Casca, he loses control and slips into psychosis. His eyes are glassy and locked in place. The only thing he can perceive is hallucinations. This is further supported by the aftermath. The fact that Guts snaps too with no memory of what he's done or knowledge of how long he was out of it. This is something that happens during real-life psychotic episodes. People who go through them regularly lose time and struggle to remember what they did, even if what they did was violent or criminal. This plays out during legal proceedings too. Criminals are judged and sentenced differently if they are determined not to have capacity, a term that loosely means control of yourself and your actions. It doesn't excuse your actions in the eyes of the law, but it will change the outcome of your interactions with the legal system. It can be hard for those of us who haven't experienced it to forgive the things that people do during a psychotic episode, or let it affect our judgment of them, especially if those acts are violent, or in this case, sexually violent. 
It's understandable and perhaps even correct to condemn Guts' behaviour in this moment. But in the real world, judging a person by their actions under the influence of psychosis is not only unfair, but ignorant of how powerful and all-consuming psychosis can be. What Guts did was horrifying, but it wasn't really him that did it. Psychosis is not something you can always power through with simple force of will or mental discipline, because will requires awareness of the world around you, an awareness that simply can't exist when the episode starts. The Beast of Darkness will likely be with Guts for the rest of his life, always arriving at the worst time, suggesting the worst path forward, dragging him towards the darkest desires in his heart. In the current, latest chapter, it's happening again. The Beast's existence and persistence is a beautiful, savage work of writing. It manages to get across the terrifying unreality of a life struggling with psychosis. It communicates both visually and narratively the raw emotional power of the hallucinations that not only speak to you, but know how to torture you. Most importantly though, it serves to humanize those who struggle with it. Guts, even for all his strength, no matter how much he wants to be free of it, still has to meet the beast head on and resist the urge to give in and let it dictate his actions. Time will tell if he'll be able to do so forever, but knowing what happened the one time it did dictate his actions conveys a valuable message regardless. Even if the struggle to fight psychosis may be futile, even if you slip and fall sometimes, it's still important that you fight it. There are many kinds of trauma that, at least in my opinion, can be weaponized as a force for good, and I've spoken about that before. The extreme emotional sensitivity that comes with BPD can be used to become kind and a protector of others, granting you a perception of suffering that few others can ever have. The trauma of being abused can lead you to become standoffish or reckless, but when you find a person willing to share your pain, it can lead to a bond so powerful it makes you capable of things you never thought possible. Psychosis is the kind of trauma that is most difficult to draw positives from. Perhaps not impossible, but it's not something I could point to very easily without giving people a misguided impression of the damage it can cause. We see this explored in the story with the Berserker armor. It allows Guts to tap into the psychosis, for sure, but every single time he runs a risk of losing himself and his friends to his blind madness. Even when it doesn't, it extracts a cost from him at an alarming speed cost that's beginning to affect his ability to keep fighting. In this world or any other world, psychosis is never your friend and can never be understood like a friend. In Fight Club, which is again a great piece of art and has a lot to say in its own right, this fact is kind of brushed aside for the purposes of storytelling. Tyler Durden, the main character's beast of darkness, revels in explaining what he is. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you want to look, I fuck like you want to fuck, I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. By the end, Jack or Cornelius, or whatever his real name is, can predict what Tyler Durden will do, and uses his knowledge of him to defuse a bomb, and shoot Tyler in his own face. Great end to a story, sure, but not reflective of what really makes psychosis what it is. It presents psychotic breaks as something cohesive, understandable, internally predictable. Berserk holds no such illusions, and that's what makes it a better portrait of psychosis. At least to me. Guts can never see his psychosis coming. He cannot use it to predict what his darker side will do. And even if he knows what it wants, there is no way to permanently stop it. He doesn't even really know what it is. Is it a real demon toying with him, willed into existence by his desire for blood and death and power? Or is it just a hallucination? A picture conjured up by his pain and trauma to represent his desire to... just give up? He swings his sword as though it's real, but all he gets is more questions he can't answer. Even in the most recent chapter, it's still something he can't understand, and by extension, neither can we, the Observer. In real life, psychosis and all the things that live in our psychotic visions are just like the beast. No amount of insight will lead to truly understanding where these hallucinations or delusions come from. They just happen. 
They can be ignored, they can be actively struggled against, or in the best case, mostly prevented by avoiding the situations and stresses that trigger them. Oh, and by taking your meds, naturally. None of these things are easy to do. In fact, quite the opposite. They require constant and consistent effort to maintain yourself, but it's worth noting something about Guts' story that gives you hints on how to make it easier. When the Berserker armor consumes him entirely, there is always someone there to bring him back, someone whose opinion he trusts, someone who he allows to act as a guide through the chaos. Shirke, the character who not only understands losing yourself to power, but understands the importance of pulling yourself back. When he can't see, she opens his eyes. When he's hallucinating, she pulls him out. When he's deluded himself into thinking that nothing matters, she reminds him that a human soul wouldn't be so torn up over something that doesn't matter. So if you find yourself struggling with what's real and what isn't, unsure where the beliefs you have come from, or your thoughts are racing too fast for you to think, remind yourself of what has always mattered. Who understands you, even if you don't trust them right now? <laughs> Once you know that, all you have to do is listen. Hello everyone, thank you for watching. As always, if you think my content is worth a few bucks a month, consider throwing money at me on Patreon and get these videos early and unmolested by copyright bots. If you don't, then do me a favour and throw a like or comment me anyway. The algorithm is my beast of darkness and it cries out for your attention. I've got plenty of new exciting things in the works, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. I wouldn't want you to miss anything. And of course, have yourself a wonderful day.